Hi guys, it's Dr. Mindy Curry here. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I do house calls in the greater Portland area and I've got a small office in Milwaukee and I'm here to tell you today about the wild rose hips of winter and there's some right behind me. Can you see them? Those red balls back there? That is what we're looking for today and we're going to make some some great uh, medicinal foods out of that we're going to make a a rose hip jelly a rose hip syrup and uh, throw in a little tea bonus now what we're really looking for is not just any rose we're looking for the wild rose and uh, this is the rosa species in general but the wild roses are just a better better rose hip I'll, I'll go into that later, but uh, basically rose hips are best known as a solid source of vitamin C, and uh, therefore they are a scurvy preventive. So there you go, oh, you sea dogs out there, we're going to prevent that scurvy for you. Scurvy is actually a disease that used to be very important, and it was uh, caused by profound deficiency of vitamin C, and that was usually caused by a, a lack of fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, these days, frank deficiency is pretty rare, but many Americans refuse or cannot access fresh fruits and vegetables and are probably borderline deficient. This can be especially true for alcoholics who drink their meals or for elderly people that have lapsed into a habit of just having tea and toast for dinner. Um, that's not really healthy <laughs> and you can get a little bit of scurvy that way so uh, there is a, a good chance that if you're not getting enough fruits and vegetables you're kind of on that borderline vitamin C deficiency but uh, way back in the way back machine in the seafaring age back between the 1500s and the 1800s scurvy killed probably two million sailors um, more than those that died in those sea battles altogether. It took a ridiculously long time for scientists to know and figure out what caused scurvy, despite there, there had been older knowledge that, that you could prevent scurvy with citrus, but that, for some reason, everybody kind of forgot about that and went back to dying in mass from scurvy, because, yay, humans! <laughs> um, but... Uh, since humans are generally flawed and there was even an anti-fruiter movement. There were anti-fruiters who were just convinced that that lemons would actually hurt sailors. Um, <laughs> so that's pretty nuts. <laughs> In the end we, we definitely know that scurvy was caused by a vitamin C deficiency and that sailors really needed their fruits and vegetables and their limes. <laughs> lemons especially were found to be very beneficial to take along on ship voyages but limes were cheaper and so that's why they went with the limes eventually but scurvy basically it's all about bruising and you get very very swollen gums in your mouth so swollen that it's hard to swallow um, very bleeding gums your teeth fall out fatigue real swollen legs and, and eventually death so it really is no joke so so let's go uh, look around at some of these rose hips and let's make some scurvy sauce so the adult RDA is 75 milligrams a day for females or 90 milligrams a day for males but the vitamin C content in rose hips is pretty variable one study showed content ranging from 106 to 2712 milligrams vitamin C per 3.5 ounces all depending on what was uh, different species in different places that they the rose hips were harvested from higher vitamin C was actually found in rose hips that were harvested in higher altitudes. And so for best results, head up to the hills to find your roses, folks. Specifically, it's the skins of the rose hips that have the most of the vitamin C. Very little is found in the actual seed, so don't expect to get a lot of vitamin C from, say, a commercial rose hip seed oil. Also, vitamin C is denatured by heat, 
over time. So basically the longer you boil it or cook it, the less vitamin C is left. People tend to think of citrus for vitamin C, but the content in rose hips can actually be much higher than that of other fruits and vegetables. In healthy people, vitamin C supports the integrity of connective tissues and reduces inflammation. But wait, there's a lot more in rose hips than just vitamin C. They're also very high in other antioxidants and phytonutrients, including bioflavonoids, carotenoids, polyphenols, decopherols, tannins, pectins, and much more. Rose constituents have been studied for benefits to a number of diseases, including, frankly, MRSA, anti-cancer, anti-diarrhea, anti-diabetic. They generally strengthen the vascular system and support the heart and are great for degenerative vascular conditions such as atherosclerosis and hypertension. That also helps healing bruises and wounds. And the astringency, just the astringency of rose hips can tighten and constrict the blood vessels, which is is a good thing if you're dealing with some floppy old blood vessels. <laughs> oh, here they are. Here are rose hips in the wild. Just a big briar of them. They're everywhere. And they're in that pretty perfect stage of being just, just jelly. They've been on the vine long enough to where they're very squishy, very delightful. Look at these little darlings. Wild rose hips in the wild. <laughs> Beautiful. Now these are some wild winter roses of an unknown variety, but there are a variety of common wild roses you might find when you're looking for rose hips uh, on the market. One is Rosa Canina, and that's the dog rose. That's in Europe, Africa, and Western Asia. There's Rosa Gallia, the Gallic rose, and that's an early cultivated rose common in Central Europe. Rosa rugosa, a Japanese rose, which is native to Eastern Asia. And Rosa velosa, the apple rose, which is from Central and Southern Europe. Now here in the Pacific Northwest, we've got our own wild roses. Rosa nutkana, or the nutka rose, which is named after the Nucha Nulth tribe of Vancouver Island, B.C., and is found generally in the west side of the Cascades in the Pacific Northwest. There's Rosa pisocarpa, that clustered wild rose. That's also west, the West Cascades. And it's a smaller pea-like rose hip. And you'll find that mostly in stream banks and in swamps. And then there's Rosa gymnocarpa, which is the bald hip rose. And that's often found in forests and thickets. Oh, let's get up personal, close and personal with these guys. Here they are. It's dead winter. It's the middle of January and these things are ready for plucking. Full of jelly. Red. Squishy. That's when they are prime. Look at those beautiful, beautiful rose hips. Wild rose hips. And this one is not a wild rose. This is my Don Juan rose, an old-fashioned trailing rose. And it is very confused. It's blooming in the middle of winter, silly thing. Here is a neighbor's uh, cultivated rose bush. Here's some rose hips. You can see the difference between the cultivated rose hips and the wild rose hips. These are still a pretty small old-fashioned rose, but the rose hips, as you can see, they're just all orange, or they go straight to black. You're not seeing a lot of good red, ripe rose hips on these cultivated bushes. Um, and back over here to my Don Juan, the rose hips on this much larger but also never very red. 
they just go straight from kind of a greenish to a black and rotten. So I prefer wild rose hips. Okay, we're back in my kitchen here. And I've got a whole bunch of rose hips ready to process. And what we're going to do basically to start out with is make a, a rose hip mash. Um, but we're going to have to process these rose hips first. And you're going to have to clean off, you know, the bits. Here is a fairly fresh batch from today of rose hips that I picked. Not sure which kind of rose hips these are, but uh, you can see they're kind of at that soft jelly stage where they smush easy. Now you can kind of see the seeds inside. If we look really carefully, you can probably see the little hairs, those little irritating hairs in there. For our purposes today, it's not going to matter as much that there's hairs in there, but you're going to have to definitely be very careful to get them all out at the end, which we will. Here is a batch that I got last week, um, but I wasn't able to get to them right away. You can see they've kind of shriveled up and raisined a bit. That's fine. We're just going to have to go through and make sure nobody's any worse for the wear, but uh, yeah, this is a uh, perfectly good shriveled kind of raisin. We will re be rehydrating these, so it's fine. Also, you could take those and dehydrate them. Here's some some old dried rose hips. They're not nearly as beautiful looking, but they will do too. And uh, here I actually have some, some tame rose hips. These are cultivated roses. Uh, just kind of as comparison to the wild rose hips. You can see these kind of very juicy, very red rose hips. Ah, here we go. Very juicy, very red rose hips. And then we look at these cultivated ones. And these are actually some fairly old-fashioned styles. This is a Don Juan. But you can see it's not really getting red. It's going to go straight from this kind of greenish orange stage to uh, basically starting to go black and then eventually just rotting. So these ones never really get a, a very lovely um, red pulpiness. Here is another uh, cultivated bush. And these are, are closer to the wild rose hips, but you can see that they're already starting to spot up and go bad even before getting anywhere near a red color. And here's one that's gone straight from orange on this side, rotten on that side. This we do not want in our scurvy sauce. They're just different. I mean, you can use them if you need to, if they're there and that's what you got go ahead. I suspect that they are going to have less vitamin C and less flavor, but uh, eh. play around with them if you want to. Not going to hurt you. Just make sure you get off all the rot. These just don't seem to ripen. They don't seem to ripen the way the, uh, the wild rose hips ripen. See the difference here? You can you can pick out which ones are the wild and which are the tame, just looking at them together. Ah, that was a mess. <laughs> okay, so um, the things that we're going to be needing today for this recipe, um, the rose hips, some honey, some sugar, some rose water, lemon juice, some fruit pectin, um, plenty of water, stove, um, I got one of these uh, broth bags, but you can also get several layers of uh, cheesecloth or a really, really fine sieve because we want to get all those, once again, those little hairs out of there. But uh, well, what we're going to need to do first 
is we're going to have to get all the junk off of there. We're going to have to get it in there and clean these up. So let's, let's move to the sink and clean these up. Oh, snap. Now working with rose hips, just it really isn't all fun and games. Roses are actually pretty fierce plants. They have fierce thorns. Um, when I was out there picking those rose hips out in the wild, they kind of actually tore my jacket open and spilled my stuffing out. So I, I was clawed by the fierce rose. And also remember, don't forget inside those hips, those seeds are surrounded by extremely irritating hairs. These hairs, if you ignore them, they will cause intense itching to your skin and really can irritate the throat and mouth in ways that can be mm, very uncomfortable. So don't just go and chew those rose hip hips up a hole. You can nibble around the fuzzy seeds or carefully cut and scoop out the offending hair and seeds before you want to uh, chew on those raw. And if you're going to dry them for tea, it might be great just to take this time to just go ahead and scoop out that seeds so you don't have to be doing a lot of um, special sieve work trying to strain those out at the end. Um, generally for our purposes though, for making a syrup and jam, these hairs will all be cooked down, mashed up, and, and uh, shifted, sifted out so you can leave them on in for the beginning just to save time because it really does take a long time to sit there and scoop out every seed um, if you're harvesting especially a significant quantity. Now, most um, a lot of people say to pick rose hips when they're firm, but I, I say if you're going to be doing... Uh, something like a jam or something, go ahead and do it when they are soft because most vitamins are at their highest potential when that fruit is at the peak of ripeness. A deep bright red says it's very ripe to me and that's where it's at when it gets to that just big jelly stage that I was showing you in the wild rose hips. Um, for drawing teas, for drawing to make teas, it's probably easier to cut and scoop out the seeds if it's firm. Um, so maybe you don't want to pick them when they're jelly if you're going to be drawing them for teas. But also make sure that if you're getting them at the jelly stage, they're not rotten, they're not blackened. <clears throat> Basically, um, for that nice, soft, bright, ultra-ripe rose hip, wait until after the first frost and into the winter for those to be fully ripe but not yet rotten. Now what I'm doing here is filling the water into the pot. Now I'm going to make six cups of juice. I'm going to want about seven cups of water. I'm not going to be boiling this down a lot but I want a little bit extra just so I have a sufficient amount of water. Okay, let's get these rose hips uh, boiling. I'm going to get those up to boil and then turn the heat down to more of a medium and get them to where you can mash them. It basically we're just wanting to get these rose hips cooked enough to where we can mash them up into a real nice rose hip juice. Don't really want to cook this a very long time because vitamin C is denatured by heat and time. It won't all disappear the moment we boil it, but the longer you boil it, the more will go away. So let's just get this up to boil. Turn it down to more of a medium. Let it rumble around for a while until everything is nice and mashable. That's why I like to use the soft rose hips so it doesn't take quite as long to get soft. But there are a few in there that aren't quite as soft as the others. So let's soften everybody up and then we'll mash everybody up. Okay, and with what's left, let's make a tea out of that. Here's these ones from the cultivated trees. Let's open them up and see what's inside there. 
Oh, this one doesn't look great. That's okay. Hmm, yeah. Really not much of anything in there. Toss that. This one's a bit better. Look at all that fuzzy seed. Can I get that out? Now, honestly, I don't always trust just scraping it out. I'm going to still want to take that through a cheesecloth when I'm done or a fine sieve. Okay, there's my cultivated roses and dried roses. You can do this with your own dried rose hips from Mountain Rose Herbs or fresh rose, wild rose hips would be better. But this is kind of got what I got left over, so I'm going to demonstrate a tea. Might as well use what's left over for that. And just kind of a handful of rose hips for a small pot of tea. Get those to boiling. Then turn the heat down to more of a low. Let them simmer for a good half an hour. Covered. That'll do it. Rose hip tea has some mucilage so it coats and soothes mucous membranes so it can help ease a sore throat. Also the astringency helps tighten up inflamed red blood vessels. It also is soothing to digestive tract after an illness. Rose hips are also full of pectin and they're considered a cooling herb. So you might want to balance a formula if you have a chili constitution. Okay, look at how all the uh, rose hips have kind of sunk down to the bottom. Let's see, they look pretty squishy. Oh, darn squishy. So let's start mashing them. Turn off that heat. We don't really want to sit on these long enough, a long time. We are not looking for a reduction. If you're sitting on that and reducing it a lot to make your syrup, you're probably killing a lot of the vitamin C. We really want to just get that to where we can mash it up nice. That's why I like to get my rose hips soft when they're at their peak of ripeness. But if your rose hips are hard, or if your rose hips are even uh, dried rose hips, you can do this whole thing with your dried rose hips just fine. You're just going to have to use a little bit more heat and perhaps kill a little bit more of the vitamin C. But look at that, we're really getting a good mash out of these. Now this mash has got a whole bunch of little hairs and seeds in there. So we don't want to just start drinking or canning this mash. We're going to need to sieve this mash out through several layers of cheesecloth or a couple soup bags. You're going to want to do more than one processing to get all that seeds and hairs out do one and then take it through again through your cheesecloth or your soup bag or your fine sieve. Really want to get all those little seeds and hairs out. Ah. Smash it! Smash it! Just get all that pulp pulped. Mush! Mush! Macerate! Macerate! Some people do this process in a blender. 
that's totally fine too. Now the seeds of the roses might have a little bit of toxin in them, but not enough to really mess with you. So it's not going to be a big problem if you put them in a blender and grind up some of those, those little seeds. They make a seed oil, actually a rose hip seed oil, that's quite nice for topical uses. Overall, it's just a very, very safe plant. A very much of a, a berry of the rose. This is looking pretty mashy. Stella says we're almost done. These dogs like me mashing this so long. They say it's done. Leave it. Okay. Turn it off. It's off. Okay, so the next thing that has to happen here is this mash has got to get sieved out. We want a mash juice out of this. I'm going to get rid of all that. All that chunks and hairs and seeds and stuff. So I'm going to put this into my fruit press. So that's a nice easy way for me to get everything sieved out. We're going to try to go for three cups of mash juice for each of our things. The syrup is going to take three cups. The rose hip jelly is going to take three cups. Ooh. Juicy. Now what I really want to do is sieve this twice. I need more hands than I have. Woo, there we go. Kind of hot, but I'm up at the top where it's actually pretty cool. I'm going to go into a second soup bag just to get all those little hairs out just in case. The first part, I don't need to twist my fruit press, I just need to get out the extra fluid. The fruit press is good for pressing fruit. Liquid just comes right out the bottom without pressing. It's a lovely little contraption. You can see it's got one bowl that's got lots of little holes in the inside and a bowl on the outside. It's got a spigot and then over here we'll press it down. But for now, plug it back up. That is what we're going for. That's the juice, the mash juice. Let's make it press. Put the stopper in there so that nothing comes out. 
while I'm pressing. Oh, little string, get in there. This is a really great device. Little Italian fruit press. The Ferrari of fruit presses it screams. I've got a whole YouTube video on different techniques for tincture pressing, but that kind of works for this kind of thing too. That is already ready to go. Woo. Even more juice is pressing out with each spin. Very handy little device. Quite affordable compared to other uh, more industrial pressers and way more effective than any of the other kind of kitchen devices I've seen. You can really get a good twist on this thing. It's really good for just cranking on it. You can get everything almost everything out and get it down to an almost dry mash at the bottom. Especially if you get a good strong man to come in there and really crank on it. Or a really strong woman or trans person or whatever. A strong person. There we go. And that's just about right. I've got just just barely over six cups of rose hip mash juice. This rose hip mash juice here is what I'm looking for. And that's what we're gonna make our jelly and syrup out of. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is measure up for the rose hip syrup. That's the more simple one. And that the recipe here is basically you want three cups of the rose hip mash juice and one and a half cup sugar or one cup honey. Honey is sweeter than sugar. You could even probably use less than that. Um, you could Put in also a sliced orange, probably earlier, um, or a squeezed of orange, or a tablespoon of lemon juice at this point. Um, I definitely say add the tablespoon of lemon juice, a little extra vitamin C. Fresh lemon juice is the best. I don't have that right now, and I don't have an orange, so I'm going to use the jarred lemon juice. Optional. Add a teaspoon of rose water. Uh, this is a, a delicious rose flavored water that is used in uh, Middle Eastern dishes, and especially Middle Eastern drinks, and also body care. It's just a wonderful, very rosy <laughs> water made literally by soaking roses in water. And it just gives it a lot more of a rosy flavor because uh, rose hip mash, rose hip syrup, it's gonna be more, more tangy, more kind of like a hibiscus tea, and less like eating a rose. But I do love that rose flavor, so I'd like to add a little of that rose flavor in, the, the flavor of the, the rose itself back into the rose hip. So I'm gonna add like a teaspoon. You could add more of rose water. So let's start with the rose syrup. Okay, here we got two cups. Three cups added back in. A 
tablespoon of that lemon juice. Also helps with the pH, or not the pH, excuse me, the acidity. When you can, things that are very sugary are great. Things that are very acidic are great. So let's do a little bit of both if you're going to can this afterwards. A teaspoon of rose water. You know, I love this stuff a lot. I'm going to go ahead and take it up to four because I'm crazy. And because I accidentally bought the big jar. <laughs> like I said, you could add some lemon zest or you could add in some orange juice, but you don't want to add in a lot more orange juice. Probably more of a sliced orange earlier while the rose hips were mashed, were um, being cooked. That would be the good time to add a sliced orange. And then a cup of honey. I prefer honey over sugar whenever possible. This is a wonderful local raw unfiltered honey. Whenever possible, that's the, the kind you want from your own area. Can help with allergies a little bit. Oh, it's a volcano of honey. Wow. Ooh. So much honey. Decadent. <laughs> Bee vomit. And go ahead and add that into your three cups of rose hip mash. Ooh, that is starting to smell just delicious. Now a rose hip honey, I mean a rose hip place you would use a syrup. You could put it on your pancakes if you really like a nice tart tangy pancake. You can add it into your beverages. Just put it into water, Let's stir that up to make your water more tasty. You can drizzle it over ice cream, you can drizzle it over various, uh, various food items, various recipes, meats. Ah. Anywhere you want a delicious kind of tangy rose flavor. It doesn't have to have so much rose flavor. It could just be very tangy if you don't add the rose water. So that's kind of a personal preference. Do you like to eat flowers? I do. I will munch on a rose like it's candy in the right season. This is not the right season. This is winter. So I'm going to have to munch on rose hips. Ah, there we go. We're really getting that dissolved. And the rose hips do have some pectin in them themselves, so that will thicken up a little bit. But this is a uh, still hot, so it's going to be nice and thin and easy to pour into your jar and do any canning. Um, if you don't want to can it, you can just put that in the fridge to keep it nice and um, sanitary. But <clears throat> you can also take and add this into um, clean canning jars and give them a water bath or a pressure cooker and can them properly and have some proper syrup that you can put in the storage shelf storage for a while but uh, yeah that basically is your syrup let's get some jars and now what we got left to do is get that jelly Set those aside for later. 
Okay, let's make that jelly. Rose hip jelly, we're gonna need three cups of this rose hip mashed juice. We need a box of Sure Gel Fruit Pectin. Go ahead and make sure that that is not expired. If your pectin is too expired, it will not gel right. Uh, we need three and a half cup sugar, a half cup of lemon juice. Um, optionally, you can add a quarter teaspoon butter. That just prevents foam and you can take it out if you're vegan. No worries there. Um, just prevents the foaming during the bubbling, boiling process. It can get a little foamy. And some people don't like that. I don't really care, but I do like the extra richness of butter, so I'm leaving it in. And a tablespoon of rose water, that's optional. That just makes it more rosy flavored and a little bit more, um, a little bit more fragrant flavored, frankly. It adds to the flavor and I like it. I like tasting roses in my food. So <laughs> this makes a delightful rose flavored rose hip jelly. Um, it's not dramatically rose flavored if you add the rose water in there. It's still very tangy, but it definitely adds a richness that I would say is worth the effort. And this is just a bottle, a Middle Eastern bottle of rose water. It's basically just rose petals in water again. Um, so let's measure this stuff out. We've got to get three and a half cups of this mashed juice. You can see that's still steaming hot, and that's where we want it. Oh, we got a little extra. Let's put that aside. Oh, well, that one's a little above. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, three cups of the rose hip mash water. Rose hip juice. Add in three and a half cups of sugar. You might be able to get away with less sugar and more juice. You want to modify the recipe, give it a try, but beware when you start playing around with jelly recipes, things can get weird. One thing of fruit pectin, bring with sure gel. Let's start stirring that around. Half a cup of the lemon juice. Adds a little bit more vitamin C <clears throat> and a little bit more tangy. And I like that. We'll mellow that out with some of this really rosy rose water. And a quarter teaspoon of butter. Come on. Now this isn't really dissolved very well. That's okay. At this stage, we really need to put it back on the stove, get it up to a hard rolling boil, and boil it for exactly one minute. Not longer. And that'll activate the pectin. If you go too long with the boiling, you're gonna um, inactivate your pectin and not have as good of a jelly. So let's get that over to the stove. Okay, there it is. It's very, very dissolved now. And that's where you want it nice and warm and dissolved. Go into the jars. Oh, 
I wish you could smell this. It's amazing. Uh oh. I don't think I have enough jars. I'll set that aside and deal with that later. Ah, look at the color of this jelly. It's just a beautiful, slightly reddish, pinkish jelly. And the smell, you can smell that it's astringent and tangy, lemony, extremely rosy. And that's what I expect for this jelly when it's done. So let's, let's lit up. Go ahead and can these if you'd like to using a water bath or a pressure cooker or just go ahead and do it the fridge style and just stick them in the fridge. These will gel up nicely. You will have a wonderful rose hip jelly. Now remember that if you're going to go ahead and can these, the longer that you immerse something in heat and time, the less vitamin C there will be in there. But it does take a while, so if you're hoping for long-term preservation, you can definitely get some vitamin C out of that. But maybe less than if you went for just having this fresh, fresh out of the fridge. I mateys, scurvy won't be a problem for us now. Arg. <laughs> that was a pathetic pirate accent. I'm so sorry. Okay, and you can either just go straight ahead and put those in the fridge after they cool off, or you can go ahead and put them in a canning bath for 10 minutes only. Don't go over 10 minutes or you'll start to inactivate the pectin again. But that should can it and be good for shelf stability. Also has a lot of acid and sugar, which helps for shelf stability. Go ahead and can those in the hot water bath, 10 minutes only. And that should give us jelly. Okay, we're here at the end. Let us see what we've made here. This is the syrup, and I'm going to, it's a very thin syrup. If you want it to be thicker, you could, when it was hot, added a little bit of sure gel, maybe a tablespoon or so, or more sugar. Um, I would not recommend reducing it down a lot because that will kill the vitamin C in it, um, basically. But this is more of a thin syrup. Um, the way I've made it, um, I like to use it to put into my soda stream carbonated water to make a rose soda. It's very nice. And it, it's still fine. It's a little thin, but it's still fine for putting on ice cream if you like. For that, you might want a thicker syrup. I'll admit that. But this is just fine for my purposes. The jam has gelled up nicely. Nice consistency there. Pretty perfect for a jam in my case. Go ahead and put that on some toast. And you're having a great time. Enjoy rose hip jelly and rose hip sauce.
lightning strikes and we can't run Your breath is short and my heart begins to race Could this be it? Is this the one? I've waited so long to feel this alive I dream that tonight you will be by my side There's just one love to win and I know that this is it Yeah, there's just one love, it's true and I know it's me Across the room I take a pause Before I speak I ache for your touch Please make it soon Can't control what I feel Wanting you to see What I'll do with you When you leave with